Good afternoon again, or morning, or evening, whenever you happen to be watching this. And uh, we again are coming to you through the, the YouTube. Uh, Bible studies are different, aren't they? Life is different. Coronavirus has created new opportunities. Things that uh, we're doing today that we would never thought that we'd be doing. And uh, how long this is going to be, the Lord knows. I don't know if anybody else knows, but the Lord knows. And uh, I hope that you are blessed by the best still. I am. Uh, the Lord says, you know, that he'll bless us. And he does in many ways. And uh, today, I'd like to talk to you about some things that we experience as we go through life. Uh, as we go through life, we experience tough times. We experience storms, what I call the storms of life. They happen. And, uh, you know, what, what is a storm? You know, we think of thunderstorms, we think of snowstorms, we think of hurricanes, we think of tornadoes. But there's also storms that come into life. And what are storms filled with? Well, I jotted some things down here that uh, I think storms have. Uh, every storm. Uh, there's uh, fear in a storm. There's uncertainty. There's uh, a lack of knowledge, not knowing what's going to happen or when it's going to happen in the storm. Uh, there's sadness. There's sorrows. There's anger. All these things, and sometimes in some storms, it's all those things added together. And in some situations, it may be just a storm of sadness, a storm of sorrow, uh, something that uh, we go through. Trials and tribulations are storms. And uh, as we go through life, we experience those things. And what or when do storms come? Well, there are storms that come when we least expect them. There are storms that come uh, when we expect them. We, we know that storms are coming, uh, you know, in the wintertime. Uh, on the news, the weatherman tells us that there's snowstorms coming in the next day or two, and we can prepare for them. Uh, in the springtime, they tell us when winds are coming, when uh, thunderstorms are coming, uh, and we can prepare for the heavy rains. We can pre make preparations for those things. But in storms of life, those things sometimes are the same. Sometimes we know that something's on the horizon. We know that we have a loved one that's gravely ill and in hospice care. And they're, the doctors are telling us it's just a matter of days or hours. And their life would be taken. And we can prepare for those things. And then there's times that there can be an accident and, and not be prepared. We get a knock on the door or we get a phone call that a dear loved one is grave, has been killed in an accident. There's no way of preparing for that. And life is full of those things. You know, uh, in uh, John 16:33, Jesus says, In me you may have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation. Uh, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And in that little verse, Jesus spoke some very prophetic things, some promises. Uh, in me you may have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. And there's five things that I, that I find in that verse that are promises, good and bad. One, that's the promise of tribulation. We read that and the first thing that jumps out at me 
is in this world you shall have tribulation. Bad things will happen. And it shall happen. And there's, I tell people that shall means three positions. You're either in the midst of one, which we are in the midst of one right now with this coronavirus, not only in our local community, in the state of Ohio, in our country, worldwide. We're in that tribulation. It's, it's a tough thing. It's things that, that we have to deal with that's not easy to deal with. So it is a promise of tribulation. Uh, and then there's the promise of peace. Jesus says, in me you may have peace. That's a promise. Third, we can have good cheer. He said, in me you may have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer. Even in the toughest times, look for the silver lining. Look for the blessings. They're there if we look for them. And then, number five, or number four, uh, Jesus the Christ has overcome the world. He's overcome the trials and the tribulations. And that's a great promise. To know that no matter what we're in, Jesus, the Christ, our Messiah, has overcome all things. And then five, that verse gives us great comfort. To know even in the trials and the tribulations, there are good things. There's peace available. We can have good cheer. And to have the confidence, the sureness to know that comfort is given through Jesus Christ. What a great thing that is to know. So, in this world, in this life, there are storms that do come. They come when we least expect them. They come when we expect them. And, and scripturally, if you look at John 11, verse 8, Jesus has got a word that his dear friend, Lazarus, was gravely ill. And Jesus knew that Lazarus was gravely ill, not only that he got that word, but he's told his disciples that were there with him that Lazarus is asleep. And they understood it to be that he was dead. And he was. They, they buried him. He was there in the tomb, as we know, four days before Jesus came there, before Jesus cried out, Lazarus, come forth. And as we know the story, Lazarus came out of the tomb, resurrected. But before Jesus went there, there was this great uprising against Jesus. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the rabbis were very upset with the things that Jesus was saying, the things that he was doing. And you know, at one point, they were going to try to stone him. And here, Jesus had to go back to Judea, back into the hot spot, so to speak. And he told his apostles, let's go back. Let's go back to, to Martha, to Mary, to Lazarus. And the disciples said, no, we, we can't go back. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're plotting to kill you. You know, we can't go back. And Jesus says, no, we're going to go. And he explained to them that Lazarus wasn't just sleeping, that he was dead. And he must go to minister to this situation. And then in verse 11 of John, uh, or chapter 11, uh, verse 16, uh, Thomas said to the other disciples, as Jesus said, we got to go back, I'm going back. And Thomas said this, 
unto uh, his fellow disciples, let us go that we may die with him. I mean, they knew the circumstances. They knew that it was going to be a, a bad situation going back. And that even to the point of killing Jesus and his followers. But Thomas said, let us go with him, even if it means our death. So they were, they were looking at a storm. They were looking at even possible death. What a tremendous storm. And, you know, we go through life looking at all these things that we experience individually. You know, we are in this COVID-19 tribulation, this storm that is worldwide. But within this worldwide storm, we may be experiencing storms within a storm. We may have someone that is ill, that has caught the virus. You may have caught the virus. And we're fighting that. There are financial storms that we're fighting within the virus. Many of you are home, not able to work. And you're wondering how the bills are going to be paid. And that is a, a trial, a tribulation, a storm. Uh, we find in storms a lot of stuff, a lot of bad things. And, uh, but again, there are blessings in the midst of a storm. And I have found in storms, however bad they may be, however short they may be, or however long they may be going on, if we stop and look and search, we'll find that many times there will be more blessings in the midst of the storm than there are the cursings. Uh, you know, we have to hunt for them though. There are times that a blessing will just drop in our lap and, and it's a blessing that we don't, but many times in storms that will continue, major storms that we're going through, Storms that we can't see the way to get out of. I mean, the storm has us surrounded. You know, with this virus, uh, it's worldwide. And we can't see going forward, getting out of it. We can't see going to the right or the left or going behind us. It's something that has us surrounded. Wherever we go, we see signs of the storm. People with masks on. People that are trying to keep the six feet spacing. Uh, we had to go to the doctor uh, yesterday, Janet, the day before yesterday. Janet had to have some blood work. And when we walked into the facilities, they asked us a series of questions. Have you been out of the country? Have you been out of state? Have you come in contact with somebody that has the virus? Have you had the virus? And we have to answer these questions. And then the last thing before we can go into the, the lab to have the blood work done, they took a thermometer and scanned our head to see if we had a temperature. I've never had that done uh, going into a, a facility, whether it was a doctor's office or a business. But this is something that may be something we'll have to get used to for several months, that we go into some place and they'll scan us to see if we have a temperature. Those things happen. But there's also blessings. You know, we just had Easter. And it was a different Easter for most of us. You know, we normally have a house full. We have six of our great-grandchildren there. And we always, if the weather's nice, we always hide Easter eggs outside. If it's not, we hide them inside. And the kids all go for hunting the eggs, and how thrilled they are when they find an egg. What a blessing that they find an egg and bring it back to the box, to the carton to put an egg in. They think they've achieved something. They've hunted for something, and they've found it, a beautiful colored egg. And sometimes the eggs may be some of the plastic eggs that have a gift in them, and when they find that, they're really joyed. 
I remember as a being a young boy uh, playing hide and seek. You know, the one is it, hides their face and counts, and then they holler, here I come, ready or not, and they begin to hunt. And when they find somebody, they found someone, they, they captured them. Uh, you know, that was a good thing. And, uh, you know, sometimes when we hunt for things, really earnestly hunt for the blessings, we'll find them. And what a blessing it is that we find the blessings. Uh, and then, uh, I have to think of David. David, who was a man of a lot of trials and tribulations, but also a man of many blessings. And one of the scriptures that always comes to my mind when I think of David, and in the blessings and the cursings, is Psalms 27. And I want to read to you part of that psalm. Starting with verse 2. I always skip verse 1 and I like to come back to it after I read other verses. And Psalms 27, verse, 20, or verse 2. David writes, When the wicked, even my enemies, and my foes came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. I think of Thomas, when he told his other fellow disciples, let's go with him. Even if we're killed, we'll die with him. They were going into a situation that was pretty tough. And they were looking at death. And here David is looking back over his life. Some feel that David wrote this psalm in the latter years of his life looking back over some of his situations that he had to deal with. And even though the foe came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. He was looking at death straight on. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this I will be confident. One thing I have I desired of the Lord, that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. David's saying, even though I'm facing death straight on, even though the enemy's coming at me, I look to the Lord for strength. I look to the Lord for the comfort. I look for the Lord for protection and that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Verse 5, For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle. He shall hide me, and he shall set me up upon a rock. David doesn't say that he'll shoot me and protect me, and he'll set me on a rock, which is good to be set on a rock, a symbol of something solid, a sure foundation. Jesus Christ is our sure foundation. He's our rock. But he added to that, not only is the Lord going to set me on a rock, but he's going to set me up upon a rock. Being set up upon a rock. A signifying of height. An elevation. And I think of the old time westerns that there would be an Indian uprising and the settlers would have to, to run to the fort for safety. Something that was built, that had high walls that the Indians just couldn't come right into. The Indians would have to put ladders up and try to come in. And the settlers would go in and they're in the dirt on the ground of the fort. And they can't see the enemy. They can't see what's coming. In order to see what's coming, they had to climb the ladder, the steps to get up to the catwalk that went around the fort 
that you were able to see over the wall, to see the enemy coming. But in those old westerns, what you also saw was in the distance, beyond the Indians coming to the wall, would be a cloud of dust. And in that cloud of dust was the infantry, the soldiers coming back to the fort, the reinforcements coming back, their saviors coming back to run the Indians off, to make it safe for those that were in the fort. And here David says that the Lord is going to set him up upon a rock, giving him height, giving him elevation. And in verse 6, it continues with that thought. It says, And now shall my head be lifted above my enemies round about me. Therefore, I will offer in his tabernacle the sacrifice of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. His head being lifted over the enemy. Being able to see over them and see the reinforcements. To see what is coming that the Lord is there. The Lord will bring salvation to him. And then uh, that he will give the sacrifice of joy. The sacrifice of joy. And sing, yea, sing praises unto the Lord. You know, sometimes it's hard when we're going through a tough time. When we're in the midst of what we're going through right now. Not knowing if we're going to get this illness. Not knowing how we're going to make our rent payment, our house payment. How long are we going to be staying in our homes, not being able to visit? How long will we have to come to church dressed as you are, but stay in your car? Just how long will that be? Will the Lord gives us the ability to look over those situations and not knowing sometimes the time frame but we know that there's a better day coming we know that the lord is in charge and he is there for us to continue to strengthen us and to encourage us and to sing praises and to give sacrifice of joy what is a sacrifice of joy? The sacrifice of joy. A sacrifice. A sacrifice is giving up something that we really don't want to give up. You know, last week at Easter, my last uh, teaching, we talked about the Paschal Lamb. We talked about the sacrificial lamb, the Passover lamb, the initial lamb in Egypt that was sacrificed. They had to take their best lamb, the very best one that was without spot or blemish. And they had to kill that lamb to sacrifice it, to get the blood to mark the doorpost, and then to go in their home and to prepare that lamb and to eat all of that lamb. That was a sacrifice. It's giving up something that's hard to do. You know, sports are shut down. We're in, coming into baseball season, and there's no games. There's no practices. The Ohio State football team, they had to not have the spring game. It didn't happen. We don't know when these things are going to come about, when we'll be able to go to games and watch them again. But one of the things about baseball, you know, sometimes... There may be two men on and the heavy hitter, the home run hitter is up to bat and his team is behind. And he's thinking in his mind, pitcher, give me a fastball down the pike. I can hit it out of the park. Give me the pitch I want. I'm going to do it. I'm going to knock a home run. And he looks over to the base coach, and the base coach goes, gives him a signal to sacrifice, to ground out, to pop up. 
And he's thinking, no, I can knock it out of the park. I don't want to sacrifice. I don't want to get thrown out at first. I don't want to pop up a, a, a ball and be called out. No, I want to hit it out of here. But he has to do what the coach says. He has to sacrifice. You see, the coach knows the percentage of him hitting that ball out of the park is not good. Even though he hits home runs, he doesn't hit them every time he's up. And they have to advance those runners on base. So what he has to do is ground out, pop up to advance those runners. He has to make a sacrifice. And sometimes in the midst of our trials, in the midst of our tribulations, in the midst of our hard times, in the midst of a storm that we are in the midst of, it's hard to think about praising the Lord. It's hard to make a sacrifice of joy. What have I got to be joyous about? What can I praise the Lord about? Well, there's plenty if we stop to think about it. You got up this morning, didn't you? That's something to praise the Lord about. Right now, sun's coming through my window. I love a sunny day. That's something to praise the Lord about. I'm not ill. You may not be ill. You may be getting over an illness. That's something to praise the Lord about. And if you can't think of something like that, just look out your window. It's spring. Grass is starting to green up. Trees are starting to bud out. Spring is a time of renewal, a time of refreshing. I love the spring. And that's something to praise the Lord about. And if you can't, if you can't think of anything, turn to the Psalms and read the Psalms. There are so many things to praise the Lord about in the Psalms. Psalms are full of praises that David wrote, that others may have wrote. And one of the things that comes to my mind about praising the Lord in the time of trouble, in the time of tough times, is Psalms 91. The psalmist here says, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge. He's my refuge. He's my God. And in Him will I trust. He's the dwelling in the secret place of the Most High. Shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And surely... He shall deliver thee from the snares of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. And he shall cover me with his feathers and under his wings thou shalt trust. Boy, is that not something to praise the Lord about? When I'm in a storm, to think that the Lord is literally a place of dwelling, a secret place of the Most High, and he will cover me with the feathers of his wing. That is my fortress. And in him I can trust. I put my trust in continually. What a neat thing that is to know. And then back in Psalms 27. David writes in verse 11. He says, Teach me thy way, O Lord. Lead me in a plain path because of my enemies. And then in 13 and 14, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Boy, that's a hard thing to do. I'm not a good one that wants to wait. I want things to happen and happen quickly. But there's times that we need to sit and wait on the Lord. And, you know, 
that can be a blessing in itself. How many of you have found time in the last three weeks to increase your prayer life? To increase time that you spend with your loved one, your wife, your children, your very immediate family that live within your home, the time that you're spending now. Yes, sometimes it can be pretty tough. The kids can get on your nerve. And sometimes you need to send them to another area of the house or to send them outside to the yard. But still, think of the time that you're having to spend with them. Think of the time that, that you can spend reading your Bible that you would not have spent before. And even in the midst of this terrible storm, think of the blessings that you may have already experienced and spending that extra time with loved ones, spending that extra time in prayer, spending that extra time that you have now in reading the Word and growing in the Lord. What a blessing, true blessing that is. And David finds in verse 11 that he was seeking guidance, direction. The Lord's always there in the midst of the storm, as dark as it may seem, to guide us and direct us out of the storm. Again, in the Psalms, Psalms 119, 105, it's a verse that I have memorized over the years and used so much personally as well as sharing with others. And it says, the Word, and we know that Jesus Christ is the Word. The Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. He is that light. He is the Word. And in our darkest times, the moment, the very moments that we're standing in right now, for some of us, are very dark. But the Word, Jesus the Christ, the light of the world and the light of life, illuminates where we're standing. He dispels the darkness. And not only that, but He'll guide us. He'll direct us. As David said in verse 11, Teach me thy ways and lead me in the path. Lead me out. Guide me. Direct me. Lead me into the path of light. That the darkness around me, the trials and tribulations, will, will fade away. They, they may still be there. But the darkness isn't as dark as it was because the light dispels the darkness. And then in 13 and 14 I read, there's confidence in God. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. There's confidence to know that the Lord is good. And there is goodness that flows from God. God so loves you and loves me. God is love and love flows from Him. And then we can take courage. We need to have courage when we fight the battles. And there are battles to be fought. And we need to fight them courageously. And strength is promised. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. And He shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, upon the Lord. There is that strength that is promised. And Philippians 4.13 You can do all things. And this is even in the midst of the storms, even in the midst of the trials and tribulations, even in the midst of hard times, in the midst of all of that, you will be strengthened. There's strength that is promised if we just wait upon the Lord. In the midst of the storm, there are things that we can look for. The teaching on blessings in the storm, there's about six weeks that I have on that teaching. 
I'm not going to do six weeks probably. But this is the first installment. And we'll pick up next week on some other storms and how to find blessings in the midst of the storm. Sometimes we need to have the pump primed. And I hope that this little teaching that we're able to prime the pump a little bit to make you understand to look for blessings in tough times. And when we begin to do that, I have found, even in the toughest of times, when I look for my blessings, that diminishes the toughness. If you look at Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter, I think it's 28, that deals with the blessings and the cursings. And next week, we'll deal a little bit with, with that. How we can deal with the tough times and look for the blessings. And begin to count. Learn to count the blessings in the midst of the storm. I want to give you an assignment. Between now and next week, when I do another taping, I want you to look around in your home. I want you to look around in your property. I want you to look around in your family. I want you to look around in maybe phone conversations. Look around when you have to leave your home and put on the mask and go into a store. I want you not just to go to the store to get your grocery list, but I want you to write on the top of your grocery list. Hunt for the blessings. Hunt for the blessings. And maybe take a sticky note and put on your bathroom mirror. Hunt for the blessings. And at night when you go to bed, on your nightstand, put another sticky note. How many blessings did I find? How many blessings did I find? Begin to record your blessings. And now, now that you're going to record them, keep those. Because when the next storm comes, you can go back to the blessings you found in this storm and say, you know, I found that blessing in the storm weeks ago, months ago, years ago. And that's a blessing that I can look for in this new storm. The blessings are there. Let me pray with you. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for this day. For truly, 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 we are blessed. Blessed by the best. And you, Lord, are the best. The best of bests. Not only are you good to us, but you give us blessings. The best of the blessings that are there for us to receive. And may we look for them and hunt for them and receive what you have for us. Help us, Lord, through today and through tomorrow and for the tomorrows to come. As we work through this coronavirus, as we work through the things that have changed, our lifestyles that have changed, and how our lifestyles may continue to change in this life as we go through and as we are able to have things lifted, but still things that have changed, there will be things that we'll have to continue to deal with. And help us, Lord, to be able to deal with them, not to get so aggravated and angry that we fail the focus and to look in the situations for the blessings that you have for us. So help us. Help us, Lord, to realize that we're blessed in the midst of the storms. We pray this in your precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen. God bless you guys, and we'll pick up next week 
on Blessings in the Storm. <laughs>